Uh, good evening to all of you and very warm welcome uh, to the London School of Economics. Uh, my name is Gobind Nankani. I am the Executive Director of the International Growth Center. And we're really delighted today to welcome you to this seminar, which uh, has two purposes. One, of course, is to bring to you uh, scholars and representatives from four developing countries who will talk to us about how the global crisis and its unfolding is having an impact on their countries. And the second reason is to give us an opportunity uh, to launch the International Growth Center's website, new website, uh, today. Now, let me say a few words about the International Growth Center, do a quick launch, and then we can proceed with the rest of the program. But before I do that, I just want to acknowledge the presence of a few uh, uh, of our colleagues here, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Paul Collier and Robin Burgess, both co-directors uh, with me in the, in the International Growth Center, and Callum Miller from uh, the Growth uh, Department in, in DFID, who will also be with us momentarily on, on the launch of the website. Um, the International Growth Center was uh, initiated and funded by DFID, the Department for International Development. And it's a, it's, a, it's a venture in which between LSE, Oxford, and a number of international partners around the world, we think we are introducing uh, a somewhat new approach to development work. Uh, I say that because I think there are a few characteristics that stand out in the approach we've adopted. One is that our approach to policy advice is very much demand-driven. It's very much a function of what is on the minds of policymakers in the countries we are working in. Secondly, the policy advice is very deeply rooted in high quality existing or new research. Thirdly, we focus a lot on a long-term engagement, not a short-term engagement, not a visit-driven uh, uh, approach to development work. Fourthly, a strong emphasis on partnerships, both at the country level and at the regional level. The IGC's focus is primarily on Africa and South Asia. We're working very closely with the research networks in both of those regions. We have with us also this evening uh, Dr. William Laikurwa, who's the head of the AERC, uh, and his colleagues. Uh, we couldn't get the representative of Senai here, but uh, we know that they're very strongly supportive of what we're doing. Um, I'd like now uh, to take a moment to call Ramesh, uh, who helps us on our communication strategy, to help us to launch the IGC website. As you know, uh, for communications in this day and age, websites and the agility with which people can refer to websites is crucial. And uh, Ramesh will give us a launch and a few, uh, a few uh, indications of the richness of this website. Okay, is this one on? Yes, good. Um, so the, uh, the IGC website is, is one, one component uh, of the overall communication strategy of the, uh, the centre, but it's a key component. Uh, the IGC thinks, thinks in terms of communicating at at least three, three levels uh, within the country, within the partner countries that we're, we're working with, cross countries so countries can learn from each other, and globally. And the website plays uh, two key roles in, in that communication. Communicating to each level what the IGC is doing and, and what it plans to do, and then informing and influencing policy discussions at each level so as to achieve the ambitions of, of sustainable growth. Let me just show you some of the, uh, some of the pages. This is, this is the, uh, the home page. So the IGC, as, as, as Gobin says, is all about providing demand-led policy advice based on frontier research. And the home page of the website reflects both aspects of the IGC's work. So on the left, you see the uh, country engagements, uh, three so far, more to come. Uh, on the right, at the top, top right, we have the uh, IGC News, where you can learn about the IGC's activities. And then just below that, the 10 research programs, each led by distinguished uh, scholars. And in the center is uh, what the, the, the column we're calling Ideas for Growth. This is where demand-driven policy and frontier research meet. So that's the, that's the home page. I'll give you some samples of, uh, of the three kinds, main kinds of pages. So this is, a, uh, this is a country page. This is the Ghana country page. This is the way into uh, to, uh, research and policy uh, issues in Ghana. 
Engagement is here is still in its early stages, but there are already ideas on the table, if you like, uh, in the three articles in the centre column, including the first one by our, uh, by our director, Govind. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm going to show you an example of a research programme page. This is the macroeconomics programme. Uh, and giving you a flavour of the different kind of elements it'll have in it. Uh, the first article explaining the programme's research agenda. Uh, then a, uh, a research-inspired article by Chang Tai Hsieh from the University of Chicago, who are another of our research partners. Uh, an article featuring this, uh, this meeting the, of the Global Crisis Group. Uh, and then an article uh, on uh, research priorities in Ethiopia, where macroeconomic stabilisation is a key policy concern. And then finally, because I'm as keen as you are to hear what uh, these uh, visitors have to say. Here's a, uh, here's a meetings page, and this is um, the first, uh, reflects the first meeting of the Global Crisis Group that was held last month at London Business School. Um, and uh, here, here we have a little account of it, and then audio clips and slideshows from the meetings, because not everyone can attend these uh, IGC meetings in person. So we need a way to communicate with uh, widely dispersed audiences around the world. Uh, and then similarly, with this meeting, we're recording all the presentations uh, and uh, the discussion, and we'll be putting up on the website uh, within the next week or so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramesh. Callum, may I call on you to just say a word? Thanks very much, Gobind. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to say what I promise will be a very brief word. Um, a word from our sponsors, as you might think about it. Um, DFID is very proud to have initiated the concept of the International Growth Centre and to be providing the financial support to the centre and its very impressive leadership team who are represented here tonight. When the IGC was launched in December last year, our Secretary of State, Douglas Alexander, recalled the action of FDR in creating a brains trust to support the economic recovery of the US in the 1930s. He went on to describe the IGC as the brain trust for developing countries looking for growth solutions today. So if the IGC is the brains trust, then we hope very much that the excellent website that we're profiling this evening will be both the vault and the marketplace for the trust's ideas. We hope it will provide an invaluable forum for policymakers and for leading researchers to exchange views, to share lessons, to pose questions, and to challenge each other. All of this with the goal of supporting the IGC's core mandate to promote sustained growth in developing countries by promoting demand-led policy advice based on frontier research. So as with most sponsors' pitches, all I can say now is, you've seen our product, tell your friends, please use it. Please join us in publicizing the website and using it to your own ends as policy advisors and as researchers. Thank you. Um, I think we should now, thank you very much, Callum. I think we should now get, get going with our program. As you know, uh, this is being done under the auspices of the Global Crisis Group, which is a part of the International Growth Center's work program. Something that we put together as a result of the sudden change in the global environment shortly after the IGC was set up. We were very, very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Richard Portis, who is Professor of Economics at the London Business School, to, uh, who agreed to lead the Global Crisis Group. And he's going to kick us off uh, this, this evening with some, some observations on the global environment. Beyond that, we're going to have uh, the rest of the program divided into two sections. The first section will give us a perspective from Africa. And in that, we have two eminent speakers from the African continent with us today. We're very, very pleased to have Dr. Njuguna Ndungu, who is the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, who will give us a perspective on how the crisis is unfolding in Kenya and what Kenya's response has been. He will be followed by Professor Ernest Aite, who is the director for the Institute of Social and Statistical Economic Research in the University of Ghana in Legon, which has been described as one of the best think tanks in, in, in Africa, who's also the head of the Africa Initiative at the Global Program at Brookings in, in Washington, DC. And then we will have Richard uh, facilitate a Q&A session with all of you on the African part of the program. Then we'll, we'll follow with, with the Asian perspective and we'll have a presentation from China by Yong Ding Yu, who's the director 
Institute of World Economics and Politics at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing, followed then by Sir Dr. Sujit Balla, who is the head of OXUS Research and Investments and who has been a, 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 an eminent uh, commentator on investment matters uh, both in India and globally and has published uh, extensively on global issues. So that's the plan for, for the rest of the evening. So may I turn now to Richard Porters. Thank you, Govind, and thank all of you for coming. Uh, I think we have a, a very good menu in front of us for the rest of the afternoon, and I will therefore not go on very long so as to give you more time with our distinguished speakers whom we have brought from pretty far away. I hope you're impressed at the, uh, at the way in which the Global Crisis Group has been able to uh, assemble a distinguished group uh, of speakers from, uh, from the main areas with which uh, the IGC uh, deals. Uh, I'm, my field is international macroeconomics and finance, and ever since uh, August 2007, whenever I see anybody who asks me, how are you, how are you doing, I say, hey, business is good. You know? uh, it, uh, we are in a counter-cyclical industry, um, the people who do what I do. Uh, and uh, although the world may be falling apart around us, uh, nevertheless, we find it absolutely fascinating. <laughs> and uh, I, my own focus, in part, has been on the global imbalances. Uh, that is to say, the large current account surpluses and deficits uh, that started to build up at the beginning of, the, uh, of this decade, uh, and uh, which, in my view, were the fundamental and are the fun were the fundamental cause of and are the fundamental danger facing us in the future cause of the crisis. Uh, that is to say, I'm not a great believer in the idea that uh, it's the problems in the financial sector and so forth. Uh, those were those are important. There are clear flaws in regulation, uh, incentives, and so on and so on. But um, the flaws would not have appeared had there not been the big current account imbalances, the associated capital flows, which uh, overwhelmed the capacity of even the sophisticated financial intermediation systems of the UK and the US to deal with them. And uh, that's how we got where we are. The question, to my mind, the big macroeconomic question as we go forward is how to correct those global imbalances. Because if we don't correct them, the same problems will recur, I assure you. Um, in a few years' time. The asset price bubbles, you know, they, don't, uh, they, may, they may pop at one point, um, but then they come back, and they can come back. And if we don't fix this, um, I think we've got a problem. Now, the trouble is fixing it uh, requires that, in particular, that the surplus countries cut back, be willing to cut back their surpluses. And uh, we have representatives from two major surplus countries here this evening, uh, the issue is, um, is it likely that they will cut back their surpluses or that their surpluses will fall? Uh, and what sort of insurance can the global financial system give them if they are willing to give up the accumulation of very large foreign currency reserves? Uh, and that then leads us to the role of the International Monetary Fund, which is also back in business. Um, and doing good business, if you see what I mean, uh, but, um, and, and has introduced a form of insurance, a new flexible credit line, which actually should perform the function that I'm, I'm concerned with here, to give countries the assurance that if they, if, if they do have a sudden stop of capital flows, uh, that they won't need to have a huge uh, 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 stock of reserves to deal with that, uh, but will rather be able to, to, to rely, on, uh, rely on external funding from the fund. Uh, unfortunately, so far, only a few countries have taken this up, Mexico, Poland, uh, and Colombia, and we're hoping that, that that will change. But I suggest to you that you keep your eyes going forward on this question of narrowing, the narrowing of the global imbalances. If you look at the IMF projections, they are not very reassuring on this issue. Then if we look, um, and I, I regard for this purpose, I regard trade as macro. Uh, if we look at trade, of course, 
we have seen an extraordinary implosion of world trade since, uh, since November, effectively November of last year. I was in Beijing, in fact, on the day uh, in early December where the November, when the November trade figures were released. The export figures weren't down much, actually. The import figures were down, I don't know, 17, 18, 19, 20 percent, whatever it was. Totally, total shock. And you knew that with that drop in imports, given that we're talk, we were talking basically of components and intermediate goods that were going to be embodied in future exports, that the exports would not be far behind. And indeed, that's what we've seen. Even China has had a major drop in exports. But then if we look around, uh, Japan's down 40 percent. Germany's down 30 percent. Many countries are being hit. And uh, many of the poor countries are being hit as well. Uh, and this, um, uh, we, we, we find it hard, really, to see how the actual drop in final demand can have provoked such a huge drop in trade. The answer to that lies partly in trade finance. And that is directly relevant to the countries represented here. Um, uh, and to the, and in particular to the Sub-Saharan African region. The trade finance issue was taken up by the G20 and uh, a big program of increasing trade finance in part through the multilateral institutions has, is going forward. Uh, it's going slowly, I have to say. I, I'm surprised that people aren't feeling a greater sense of urgency about getting the funds out there. And as long as the trade finance channels are tied up um, are blocked up, uh, then, uh, then it's going to be very hard to restart, uh, uh, to, to get back to uh, reasonable levels of trade. Then another major macro issue is the capital flows picture. And the bad news is obvious. Um, all forecasts, whether the Institute for International Finance or the IMF, all the forecasts say that effectively they're going to be more or less no new net capital flows to the developing countries this year, down from um, uh, several hundred billion uh, in 2008 and even more, actually, in 2007. So we're talking about, indeed, a sudden stop, for those of you who know that literature. And um, sudden stops, you know, it's not the speed that kills you when you're driving a car. It's that sudden stop. Uh, and, uh, and that's the, the danger here. Uh, and it's, um, uh, and I think, Again, going forward, we're going to, it's a big challenge for the countries with which the IGC is concerned. Now, the good news is that, um, is that spreads actually have been coming down. The sovereign spreads for most of the developing countries and the emerging market countries have been coming down over the past several months. Um, they're just about back to the level that they were before, that we were at before Lehman Brothers, before, the mid, before mid September. Uh, of last year, but that's still a substantial, substantially higher than they were at the, at the low points. They may have been unreal, unrealistically and inappropriate lo, inappropriately low at that point, uh, but, um, but now uh, there's, you know, they, they, they are, this picture is actually looking better uh, than it did. Um, and finally, uh, the fiscal pressures. Um, I would say this is another major <coughs> macro aspect of the problems that the crisis has thrown up, fiscal pressures on a, on a number of countries. Um, and uh, uh, that's partly because of the fall in availability of foreign finance. Uh, and um, that has had its impact on the fiscal picture as well. Uh, but um, what the result is that uh, it's also partly a function of the the uh, collapse of the commodity price boom, uh, where again we're seeing some recovery, and that's promising for the countries that we're concerned about. Um, the, um, but the fiscal, uh, the fiscal difficulties that many poor countries are now encountering uh, have to be watched very carefully, in particular because of the, the dilemmas they pose for policymakers. And one must hope that policymakers will not react to them uh, by um, by cutting back public investment. That would be the worst possible answer to the problems they will face, uh, but how they will deal with this 
is perhaps something that our speakers will address um, in the rest of this evening, and perhaps you can raise in questions and so forth. Uh, so I will now pass on to the uh, to, to our main speakers, um, and we will have, I hope, a very lively question and answer period. Uh, Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, may I call now on Governor Ndungu to to give us a perspective from Kenya. Once again, thank you very much for your presence here, Mr. Governor. Thank you very much, and um, I'm very happy to be here and to see some old friends. But although I've been told to talk about the Kenyan, uh, perhaps, experience, I'm going to touch more on what I think the African side has really suffered because there are some countries with but perhaps very specific characteristics. And we have been trying to do this with the Committee of Ten, and uh, at that time we were trying to influence the agenda for the G20, and trying to show how pervasive the experiences of the, the global financial crisis came about. The topic today is about surviving the global financial crisis, so it's actually giving us perhaps some forward-looking perspective and that is perhaps I'll try to look at the, the issues, what are the problems, and then of obviously focus on what are the peculiar country characteristics and what should be done. But I think um, Professor uh, Portes has really uh, perhaps focused on some of them, but we also are asking questions about where are we in terms of the unfolding crisis. Do we see it bottoming up? It's for the first time we have seen that this is a crisis coming from the center, and those countries in the periphery Perhaps some of them have it mapped out to, to see what channels and how, how the channels of effect are coming to them and how they can mitigate those channels. So these are issues that are unfolding. We don't have any specific answers. I guess I press on this. Yeah. Oh. Should do. Uh, sometimes. Uh, oh, did I switch off? <laughs> yes. Can you? Oh. There we are. Oh, then I should turn it. Very good. Way. Just yes. go forward. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They haven't, we haven't managed technology. They should, should it detect that I'm looking at it. <laughs> then it I, I, perhaps, of course, the, the, the whole idea of the origin of the crisis is well known. But what I think is very, very peculiar is that it started as a global financial crisis. It has become now an economic crisis. But I think in Africa, we're actually looking at it as a development crisis. So essentially, we're moving on into trying to define, are we really going to get the targets that we thought we'd get? Every country has come up and developed a plan. For example, in Kenya, we are talking about the Vision 2030 with particular, perhaps, targets. And this may not be achieved. That's why we are saying we can move, we can talk about global economic crisis, but actually, in Africa, we would like actually to move on and talk about a development crisis. But the OCD countries are in a recession but most of the African countries are experiencing very, very significant slowdowns, slowdown. And of course, in a continent where it has been buffeted by other shocks, and even poverty has been rampant, of course, the slowdown implies very, very significant uh, hardships in future. But of, of course, we have also seen countries, few countries like uh, Botswana and Zambia, and perhaps the DRC, they face deep economic uh, fallout just because of their own dependence on perhaps few minerals, and I'm going to talk later about even the, what has been the solution to some of these countries with the quick disbursement of uh, aid. Of course, the initial phase was, um, of course, through weakening of uh, local currencies and declining reserves, and even the stock exchanges, or, or the, the stock market, equity markets collapsed. But, of course, this has also permeated into affecting the rest of the economies, for example, Looking at the, for example, the deposition of the currencies, the, and the, or, or the position of the exchange rate was as, re, as a result of uh, uh, commodity prices deterioration. Deterioration, <coughs> but of course the other aspect of it, especially the stock market, was actually fright to safety, and even to date we are still asking fright to safety. But where was the safety in fact? So essentially, perhaps I've. Uh, can hear what uh, Professor Portes was saying is that really it's a st stop, but because you have nowhere to go to. So there has to be some aspect of it. But also what we really suffered was the global liquidity effect and the way the global liquidity was being measured in terms of dollars and banks were not lending to each other. There was a distortion. And that actually, uh, I'm going to provide some data to see how the exchange rate actually ha happened. 
in the, in the short run, we actually called it a, a distortion in terms of the US dollar relative prices with respect to other currencies. But also, the, from our point of view, the flexible exchange rate mechanism actually, or the, the exchange rate regime, helped us in terms of stabilizing. It was really an automatic stabilizer during the crisis. And I can see that for most of African countries. Of course, some of them, they have managed to reverse this kind of, uh, these depreciations, but not the full effect. In the stock, uh, the stock markets themselves, one of them, one, one of, the, one, one of the, the direct effects was just an outflow of residence funds. Of course, don't forget that some of the stock markets were extremely vibrant around this period. And so we see, we saw just an unfavorable investor sentiment just dampening the market. But of course, in some countries like Kenya, what actually happened is that the effect moved, moved into the bond market. The drawdown on foreign exchange reserves, this has been quite uh, pervasive, especially from the media, because the media looked at uh, foreign exchange reserves as really declining foreign exchange reserves as really a risk for the crisis. We try to explain, especially in Kenya, that we do not keep foreign exchange to do off-road for imports to the private sector, but rather we keep it for trying to perhaps stabilize the economy in times of crisis. We went down to 2.7 months of import, and that is very bad for the law that has been set. Of course, we started questioning the law that was being said, but that was not the best time to, it was not, the timing wasn't very good to start questioning the law. But we started defining in terms of um, the, 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 the trade-weighted um, import cover, and it was working out very nicely for us, but it was being seen as convenient. But the most important thing is that we argued, and I still continue to argue, that the Forex reserves were accumulated to cushion us against shocks. And once we are out of shocks, we can still continue accumulating. Of course, so far we have managed to go up to three point, about 3.5 months of import cover through accumulation and balance of payment support from the IMF. But it's just to make sure that we, 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 we safeguard ourselves from any, uh, any, any future things. <coughs> now, let me also look at um, perhaps what is really happening uh, or what was the combination of the foreign exchange, uh, the, 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 the movements in this the foreign ex in the exchange rates and even the stock market in some of these, uh, in, in, in some of the countries that we've been looking at in Africa. And uh, of course, the stock market, the dramatic effect was quite pervasive. So was the exchange rate volatility. And so was the increased volatility. I think the diagrams are not very, very clear cut. But the first one is actually showing the exchange rate uh, movement. And the, the other one is actually the level of volatility that came up. But huge slowdown. But if, especially for Kenya, we had come up with, uh, where that was the period when the stock market was extremely vibrant. Massive rents were actually being secured. But of course, there was also a major devastating effect internally because of course there was a major, uh, uh, there was a major IPO that of course uh, led to acceleration in terms of the, the stock market collapse. But the, 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 other, the other one that I look, I've, look, I've looked at, just to provide some data, is actually to look at the exchange rate depreciation and actually look at the period in November 30th and compare it with January 31st. I think the situation perhaps hasn't changed drastically for some countries like Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, and Rwanda, especially the East African countries. But I think South Africa may have changed slightly, or even Nigeria. But you can see just the effect of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of the exchange rate depreciation. And obviously, the global dollar effect that was driving this general depreciation. Some countries like Rwanda, the, 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 the effect was minimal in the, in the very beginning. But you can see that it's quite pervasive also for South Africa. And it's also pervasive for Nigeria. OK. Now, what about the stock market? Because the Kenyan one, and uh, perhaps Nigeria and South Africa really suffered. But of course, the more you are exposed, that's what it tells us, is the more you are exposed to the crisis, or the more you are exposed, the stock market was exposed, the more, the more was the hit. What actually has happened is that this, the Kenyan stock market has not recovered as yet. In fact, we are not so sure. Uh, of course, there has been media reports that it's creeping up, but we haven't seen this significant trend. <laughs> of course, if you look at the individual, uh, perhaps companies, there may be slight movement, but the, I, I think the there is more volatility in them. Now, of course, everybody comments about the massive wealth loss in terms of this kind of collapse. But then, 
we, we also have to ask ourselves, what about the second round effects? What's, what, what is really happening, the second round effects? For countries like Kenya that depend very much on a narrow range of exports, this has been quite significant. The slow demand for international commodity for exports has been quite devastating. Ours has been even more because it started, the crisis started in, at the beginning of 2008 with political crisis and obviously it was affected towards the end of 2008 by a major drought effect which actually affected domestic supply of food and domestic supply of perhaps even, uh, 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 even power generation. But this slowdown in production processes and obviously what we have seen in some companies is actually heavy inventory, accumulation of inventory. Some of the countries, uh, some of the companies had in, uh, their own capability, they had their, their own uh, uh, planning process of how much imports they need to keep in and how much they need to produce. Now there are no demands and obviously they had raw materials, they are keeping both inventory. Obviously the effect is working capital. The cost of working capital is going to hit them very hard. Of course, decrease in tourism for us started much earlier, although it hasn't been held. FDI and even ODI, ODA flows, but the most important has been risk of us in terms of the credit market. We even had to go out and have a workshop with the, the banking sector and the, real, and, the, and, the, and the private sector to try and bring down the fears about uh, 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 the, the risks and the, the, the significant risks that would be posed by production. In Tanzania, they have actually even had meetings, uh, have a consortium of banks trying to, reorga to organize to make sure that there are no non-performing loans, and if there are any, the government will step in and, and, and finance them through a fund, as a private fund that was generated by the government. So you can see that it has, it, it has affected some different countries in different ways. But for us, it was complete slowdown. Banks would say, I'm not going to finance anybody in tourist industry because tourism is down. Cut flower industry, no. But we started showing that there are no problems. We have gone through and mapped out and showed that there is no significant effect, especially from, specific, uh, from those sectors, in terms of non-performing loans. But that has not been enough to calm the market. So you can see that one of them is the risks and perception that has been in the market. Of course, the global, uh, there was a feeling of uh, com uh, countries coming up and trying to to protect themselves in terms of the world trade, but that is not, has not been significant. But there's a feeling that the, the second round effect could create such kind of thing. But what about the economic crisis? Um, uh, what we see, and especially uh, in our case, in terms of domestic production, industrial production, and uh, in fact, how do we map ourselves from what is happening in those countries and what is happening to ourselves? I know I have uh, less and less minutes, but I will try to press on. That's five minutes. Yeah. I negotiate another five because I've come from far, but uh, anyway, we'll talk about it. <laughs> but uh, the most important thing is that we may have escaped the full impact. I'll give you some slides about our financial sector in Kenya. We may have surpassed that, but, the, 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 but I don't think the slowdown, we are going to escape the slowdown. Let me put some few data maybe so we can look up. But obviously, the forecast on commodity prices has been very, very frustrating. It's quite depressing. And so for countries like ours that depend very much on exports, and even foods that we have really suffered more. In fact, I'll show a slide where agriculture and even drought for, uh, agricultural performance in Kenya actually drives growth. So everything else is extremely secondary. But uh, let me, um, I just wanted to show that for th those countries that depend very much on, uh, on uh, exports, you can see that the situation is not really very promising. Perhaps 2010, uh, and it can, we can see that it's very, it's very, very, very few commodities. It's not really very promising. So essentially, for countries like, for example, in the Zambia with copper, I think it's only by 2010 they are going to see a decline in 4.2. To 2009, the decline has been 32.2%. Um, now, if commodity prices, ex, ex, commodity exports have been the main drivers for growth in, in many African countries, then what is the picture. What kind of picture are we trying to create here? And this is the point I wanted to make. And, and of course, what it also portends is that the economic crisis will dampen expectations on even future growth. And we may, we may have to ask ourselves, how are we going to mitigate this for countries like Zambia, depending on copper, those countries that depend on oil, those countries depending on, on, um, on, um, on, on, on uh, perhaps diamonds. One of the points that I wanted to make here is that Botswana actually 
and this is a point I want to also to make later that country, the, the multilateral institutions came up with, with quick disbursing aid to support and to ride over this crisis. But you can see that the significant effect of Botswana getting uh, 1.5 billion from African Development Bank, it's the first in 17 years. Perhaps it may tell us about the severity of the crisis and how we have to look at it. And if Botswana could suffer, which has, perhaps has been quite buoyant in terms of its own surplus and even its own funds and even its resources, surplus in even uh, in the fiscal surpluses, you can imagine the extent of se the severity of the problem in other African countries that are not, uh, that are not very well endowed. One of, the literature, one of the issues that comes up in African countries is about diaspora remittances, and this has been very, very interesting. I just thought I could spread that kind of graph for Kenya and uh, to show that Kenya's uh, remittances are very, very precise because they depend very much on the events in the country, but also you can sh see the effect of the dip of the global financial crisis. But I think on average, monthly, uh, it's been coming to about $55 million per month, almost going back to the, to the average. But obviously, I've been asking myself, why, how do we break down these, two, these remittances in two components? One that goes to investment directly, and the other one that goes to consumption smoothing, and ask ourselves which is going to be likely to be affected. In Kenyan case, for perhaps if I could add, one of the things, one of the things that the, the diaspora finances is actually residential building, that is real property. And obviously it was because of differential in terms of, or should I say borrowing uh, requirements in, 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 Af uh, in, uh, in, uh, in America and in, in Europe. And what has happened is that they used to borrow in those banks and invest in, in Kenya because the returns were much higher. But now, of course, when the crisis hit, then obviously, banks were not reading to each other. And obviously this has come down drastically. But we haven't managed, this, uh, this is from survey data that we get from every month. We haven't managed to get, of course, the, 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 the remittances that come through the, perhaps the wallet or even uh, hard drive. Okay, some growth outlook. We have revised and revised and revised growth significantly. In fact, we are not so sure where we are currently. In fact, I'm not so sure where we are in Kenya. But I've seen that for us this year, we have said we'll be growing between 2 and 3%. African Development Bank has come up and said East African community will grow by about 6%. They are giving Kenya about 4.2%. But you can see that we have revised and revised. We are not so sure where we are. This, uh, this is data coming from different uh, 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 sources, and they are good estimates. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll, I'll be very quick okay. now. <laughs> but then I, I wanted just to say something about Kenyan growth, because this is always very interesting, because we have come from far, and I wanted just to focus on last year's growth. And quarter one was very interesting because we had, of course, political violence, everybody was knew about it, everybody thought that Kenya should not be left alone, they came to help us, and of course it worked very well. Growth, you can see what happened. Quarter two recovered and quarter three recovered. But my sense is that drought is so pervasive and drives everything in Kenya. You can see how the fourth quarter managed. And obviously, the growth in uh, 2008 was 1.7% just because growth in agriculture came down by four, minus 5.1. And the first quarter, growth came down to 0.03% because, I think that's a mistake, 0.03%, because growth, the agriculture grew by nine, uh, declined by 9.8%. Pervasive result. But it's something that we can talk about. Now, quickly, a gross over. Economic crisis, a summary of the impact. I've perhaps covered this going to be interesting perhaps to uh, <coughs> answer questions. But obviously what we think is that infrastructure is going to be perhaps uh, define the kind of fiscal stimulus that we need to get from, uh, for Kenya. I have always argued in the media places and even places that everybody is talking about fiscal stimulus for Kenya. But the question is how does a fiscal stimulus in a country like Kenya with so huge unemployment work, what we have actually argued is actually to provide Public, uh, public works to protect wage good. And Kazi Kwa Vijana, or work for the, for the youth, has been quite pervasive, has been quite important. Ours is, we have to work on the supply side, we have to reduce poverty, and we have to deal with so many aspects that are challenging. Um, but, some good news is that we didn't see much of toxic cases in, the, in uh, Africa's financial sector, so obviously, uh, the country has managed to stabilize its financial system. I'm going to give uh, examples in Kenya. 
but I think the folders are there, but some few minor, perhaps data to, to, to put in to, to explain that. We have 45 banks, of course, segmented, three tire system, big banks, medium banks, small banks, small family banks. But what I find that is everybody is perhaps within the capital adequacy that is required. And obviously, they have been doing well, but they are washed with credit. They are washed with liquidity. They don't know what to do because of the slowdown. And that is where the danger is. We've seen that we have surpassed about 940 billion in April this year in terms of deposits. Out of that, 69% of it is advanced in loans. But the next question is to ask, so if the slowdown is there and they are washed with liquidity, what are we going to do about it? And there are so many aspects of that to show actually the, the health of, uh, of, of this sector. And um, finally, of course I have drawn down in terms of what are the challenges? We see that financial sector contraction because of this confidence, real sector decline, deposit significant risk, public sector resource constraint. These are issues that uh, I've been seeing Africa in the last 10 years have actually worked on its own growth and even developed enough fiscal space. And we are now seeing that coming down. The next question is how do we deal with it? From the committee of 10, which I'm a member, we advised in several things. I think that I call them incremental solutions that we advised and they came up even into so many countries. But I think I want to emphasize domestic resource mobilization, which was very important. The first one has come out very well. Resource, resources available to ride over shocks, the IMF, the World Bank, and even the African Development Bank have been quite responsive. I think in Kenya, I think for the first record of two months, we had already some $209 million for our balance of payment support. That is the exogenous shock facility. So I commend the speed. The second one is we have to come up with domestic resource mobilization strategies. And this, we have to look at how we, we can support the supply of public investments or even private investments coming through uh, to protect the wage goods and even public works. The third one is actually institutional capacity for those institutions that should focus on the global effect and even the regulatory institutions. But I think my other, my most important one is, is to try and reverse what we, could, we didn't do in the 1980s and 1990s. We have to protect public investment uh, or should I say uh, development budgets because essentially if we don't do that we are going to sacrifice long term growth. That's what happened in the 1980s and that's what happened in the 1990s. Wherever there was an exogenous shock, the first thing was to ring fence recurrent spending because of political overtones but in the end we sacrificed long term growth. So what we are really arguing is that let's protect the growth, uh, the, the, the development budget. And that's what has happened in the Kenyan budget that was read last week that we have tried to make sure that this is happening. The aid delivery modalities and the, 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 the global financial architecture is something that has been talked about even in the, in the, in the, in the, in the G20 proposals. It's something that I perhaps not worth going uh, over right now. But the most important thing is, the fourth is an issue that we have tried to defend. And even in the allocation of budget in Kenya last week, and the East African region as a whole, they made sure that the, let's protect the development budget. After this crisis, we still want to make sure that we stay the part of reforms rather than to restart again. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for overworking the time, but I spent some good eight hours in the yes. night to come here. <laughs> so I thought I could uh, take that point and uh, take some few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Njungu, for that uh, both comprehensive overview of the continent as well as a special focus on Kenya and on long-term growth. Um, Professor Aite next from, from the University of Ghana and Brookings Institution. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm also very delighted to be here and to speak to you about how the current crisis uh, is affecting various African countries. And I'm going to use illustrations from my own country, uh, Ghana. Uh, in a way, we had not planned it, but uh, by some kind of coincidence, what I'm going to say will complement adequately, I believe, uh, the presentation that uh, Juguna has just made. Uh, the first point that I'd like to make in this presentation, the simple facts, that uh, since the crisis uh, broke, we've had the opportunity to 
several times talk to people about the crisis. And the first question I get asked often is, uh, how did it come about? And that already was very well known. Uh, everybody's talked about it extensively. It's always been a question of whether Africa is going to be affected by what is typically associated with uh, Europe, and Asia, uh, Europe and, uh, and the US. Uh, and then finally, I get asked the question, uh, do we need some stimulus package uh, very much along the lines that we've seen in Europe uh, and America. What I'm going to try and do today is talk about uh, uh, the way the crisis has affected African countries and how they have responded to the crisis and uh, the, the impact of that. Then I'll bring in a few observations about what uh, the countries are doing in terms of uh, uh, trying to modify their behavior in response to the, the crisis. So I'll talk about the nature of the global crisis. I'll talk about the channels through which African countries have been affected. I'll talk about the impact on economies. And most importantly for me, uh, the impact on the poor is very significant. And then I'll talk briefly about how to move forward as I try to uh, conclude. One thing that is important that uh, we need to think about seriously in relation to the crisis in Africa is the fact that it came at a time when African countries have been growing much faster than let's say the, the whole decade before. Uh, in 2007, your every African country grew at more than 6% per annum, unprecedented. There were 15 countries in Africa that had that close to 10%, again, unprecedented. As we all know, most of this came on the back of the economic boom that we associate with that period. So countries have been doing quite well. But much more important for us is the fact that this doing well came when they were better managing their economies. So central banks working with finance ministries had come to learn the ropes of managing economies much better than the two decades before. And then the oil crisis came, and the food crisis came. What those two crises, the food and the oil, did was basically take away a lot of the room that had been created by governments in various economies. And so by the time, let's say by the uh, last quarter of 2008, your average African country, despite the earlier growth, was beginning to experience some macro instability, was beginning to see rising inflation, was beginning to see a lot of things that we typically, the erosion of the uh, uh, space created earlier with the currency uh, in complete uh, turmoil in many countries. So there was a problem before the crisis broke. Now, what is important, therefore, is to think about how they could respond appropriately with the new uh, uh, difficulty that we are going through. So with that, I talk about some of the things that uh, the countries have been doing. Social protection has become a very big thing in many African countries. Uh, and I talk about how Ghana can be, has, can be seen as an interesting case, reflecting all of this that I've said. Growth of around 6.2% for three years. That's something that we didn't know before. Inflation of only around 10%, we didn't know that before. So Ghana have been doing quite well. And then this happened. Uh, at the same time, political change taking place. So it brings to you anything that could have happened to an African economy. Uh, and that's why I choose, not simply because it's my own country, but it, it represents many of the good and the bad things in Africa. The fiscal deficit of 14.9% last year which a new government inherited. Where did it come from? And what room does it give that new government to do many of the things that it promised during the election campaign? You know, so these are some of the difficulties that your African countries are going through and that need to be put in perspective when you discuss Africa. So the nature of crisis, we all know very well uh, where it came from as a result of uh, changes uh, in the global financial markets, uh, often not linked to any productive base in these countries. We've seen how it's moved from uh, the US through Europe, through Asia, through Africa, and so on. So there's no need to spend much time on where it came from. What is important for African countries is that many you don't expect that to have any major uh, impact, largely because Africa was not seen to be a major part of the global financial markets. Now, what is not known is that Africa had become influenced by new thoughts on how the financial markets should be organized, new standards that were being used for regulation had begun to influence the way African markets were organized. And therefore, uh, to a very large extent, Africa had become much more competitive financially than before. That's why you will see South African banks, for example, move to many other countries. 
That's why you see Nigerian banks begin to make inroads into many other African countries. There was a new competition within Africa of financial markets that today will become affected by the new situation. They were not necessarily using capital from Europe or America, but movement of capital within Africa was beginning to increase, and that is slowing down, and that's an important thing we need to think about. So typically, when we, people discuss Africa and how it's affected by the global crisis, there are these channels that we talk about. Uh, people like to talk about them as direct and indirect effects or first run effects, second run effects. It doesn't really matter how we choose to call them. There are areas in which we must focus. Uh, uh, shrinking private capital flows, we talk about that. Remittances, uh, uh, the government spoke about remittances. Then the slowdown in the demand for exports and the fall, the fall in prices, the declines in aid flows, which are very important for many countries and the reduced competition among the institutions in Africa. These are areas I want to focus my uh, presentation on. Now, in talking about capital flows, let me simply talk about uh, FDI to Ghana. When you talk to various government officials, the first thing they'll tell you is, well, there's no need to worry. There's no need to worry about the FDI flows. Uh, we've seen, they've seen evidence of FDI still being important, uh, and then some capital coming in. There's one thing that is clear from data that we've looked at for work we're doing with ODI here. The flow of FDI has not changed much. But what is important is before the crisis, FDI was growing much faster than the entire decade before. FDI had been increasing in Ghana for around 25% per annum uh, in the three years before the crisis. The figure did not change. And so in the last quarter of 2008, we didn't see much change in there. Does this mean that uh, uh, FDI flow is going to continue as before. We've done a new survey interviewing uh, owners of uh, various foreign businesses in Ghana, and they are quite skeptical about their chances of being able to provide support in the same way that they did uh, in the earlier years. So we tend to say that even though the figures for FDI have not changed much, there's a very li every likelihood that in the ne next few years, things might be different. But we see evidence of capital outflows we see new evidence that the things are moving out of the system to other countries. So, and this is happening in particular sectors, largely in the uh, uh, services sector. And that's where we see a lot of capital outflows. And that's something to worry about, in particular in Ghana, and also we've seen it in some of the Francophone and West African countries. The Investor Promotion Center does not think it's, it's still time to worry, but we, based on the figures that we are seeing, are quite worried about that. So here, I give you the FDI figures that uh, we had uh, the last uh, uh, three years, 2006, and we saw the major jump in uh, 2007, <coughs> and then the uh, small drop in 2008. Uh, government says, well, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, we, we can muddle through with this. And now uh, we uh, say, well, maybe it's not yet a big problem, but something to think about in, in the coming years. Remittances. Here, as in many other African countries, we've seen some changes, not major, not major changes. But remittances has become important when you relate that to poverty. Uh, so on the surface, um, the Bank of Ghana will tell you there's nothing to worry about. The figures are very much uh, the same as they have been for some time. Uh, and yet, uh, there's, we see some room uh, for uh, worry. When you look at the last two years, uh, typically, you would think that in 2008, things were beginning to do, uh, go, go quite well for the government, uh, for, uh, for the central bank. Uh, remittance figures were running up. But in the last quarter, we saw that the growth was far less, or was less than it had been the growth in 2007. Typically, the last quarter of the year is where we expect uh, the most growth to take place. But the last quarter of 2008, there was a dip. So central bankers in Africa, as uh, our government has simply said a few minutes ago, Get, tend not to be worried about remittance flows. We are worried largely because it affects, any drop there affects the poor more than others. Uh, and we have in the paper itself evidence that uh, uh, households in, area, in regions where remittance flows are highest are those that have suffered the most uh, as a result of the uh, declines uh, in, in the figures. Now we talk about export receipts. Clearly, there isn't much room for, uh, there isn't much concern here, uh, because exports have continued to do well, even through 2008. Uh, again, we see the uh, troubling figures for the last quarter of 2008. 
Uh, it is not surprising that exports are not too bad in Ghana, largely because the prices of our major ex export commodities are not doing too, too badly. Uh, if we look at cocoa here, uh, the price of cocoa in 2007 uh, was, uh, worse than, was less than that for 2008. So there's room for optimism there. Uh, and the central bank tells us clearly that we, we, did, we don't need to worry about that. But we'll show, I'll show you figures later uh, from the World Bank making projections into the next uh, three years that suggests that we need not be too optimistic. Uh, indeed, that the decline in the price will come much later after things have uh, more or less uh, settled in uh, uh, Europe and Asia. So that's the story for uh, cocoa. Again, for gold, um, the price is something that has remained quite stable. Indeed, uh, it's not surprising that uh, uh, the gold price has not come down sharply. Uh, many in, in the current situation, many who are running uh, to gold. So we don't expect any major changes in the price of gold in the short term. If anything is going to happen, it will likely be in the long term. Uh, so what are these projections? These are, these are the figures from the World Bank that tell us that uh, if there will be any changes, they'll come later after this year uh, in the, uh, um, as people begin to settle uh, with these uh, commodities. Aid flows to Ghana, they've been quite important for many, many years. Uh, is there any room or any need for us to be less optimistic about the flow of aid? Uh, clearly, uh, as many of the donors have promised, there isn't going to be any major cut in what aid is made available to Ghana. What's going to happen to the debt stock of Ghana? Clearly, also, many people are not worried about what's going to happen to debt. Our worry about debt stems from the fact that we've been through many years of reform in order to uh, uh, generate some resources from the HIPIC facility. The gains that were made on that score are likely to be eroded as a result of the new pressures that are coming up. That's something that we need to worry about. And uh, so when we think about aid, we think about debt, uh, often there's some room for skepticism. Uh, what this chart really shows is basically that Ghana has become very much dependent on aid in the last uh, uh, two decades. That's what this picture really is telling us, that aid has become a very important thing. So anything that is going to affect the flow of aid is going to be significant to a country like Ghana, and indeed is the case for many other African countries. So we, there are projections that aid flows will drop after 2009. Uh, this is based on figures from the OECD uh, and also from the World Bank. So we need to think about that. So I have five minutes? No, two. Two minutes, okay, <laughs> we'll be finishing. So, here we talk about the impact of, uh, of the crisis on credit availability. Uh, what is interesting with this basically is that for many of the countries, uh, the central banks report that there's not much change in the flow of credit. Where there's change observed is likely in the flow to small enterprises and to households. That's where the, the, the problem is seen and that's what happened in the last quarter of uh, 2008. I, I talked briefly about the uh, credit and the poor earlier and then that continues. What's, what are the African governments doing? Uh, I talked about the fact that in many of these countries, there's very little room uh, for maneuver. There's very little room available. Well, there are some countries that have much more room than others. But your average African country doesn't have much room. They've discussed the issues. They are quite willing to do something about it. But when a, government, a new government in Ghana has uh, inherits a deficit of 15% of GDP, uh, what can you do? And it has promised in its party manifesto that it's going to provide free school uniforms for kids, it's going to build roads in rural areas, it's going to increase water supply, etc. This is time for pause. This is time to think through and, and begin to ask yourself which areas are priority. The one thing that I can say for many African countries is the fact that uh, the way they've handled uh, the current crisis is very different from the way they handled the oil price shocks of the 70s. In the 1970s, many countries continued as if nothing had happened. They saw the shock as something that was temporary, something that was uh, going to be a short-lived one, and therefore did not adjust anything. Today, your every African country has learned the experience of the 70s. So what I've seen in many, many countries has been an adjustment of the fiscal program, an adjustment that reflects what they see, and that the government talked about earlier. I've seen budgets revised twice in several countries, in this year alone. The growth figures keep changing, the public expenditure figures keep changing, largely because governments want to be more realistic than before. That's an improvement over the past 20 years, and I see that as, a, as an outcome of the reforms that many of these countries went through. 
as I end, I talk about how to move forward, and I think the governor spoke about some of them. I talk about the fact that the most important outcome of the crisis is not what direct effect it had on African economies, but what it does to them in terms of what they cannot do. Many of these economies were beginning to manage their economies better. Many of them were thinking about social protection, were thinking about uh, uh, more productive investments, were thinking about how to transform those economies. What the crisis does is take away the room they had for doing that. So you're not going to see banks closing down, you're not going to see firms shut down, you're not going to see a change in the employment figures, but you are going to see a limited ability of the state to provide social protection. You are going to see very little room for building institutions that will facilitate investments in those countries. And that's what countries need to think about. So we propose that it's time for us to think, take a long-term view, a much longer-term view, structural transformation. If African countries depended less, or let's say if Zambia depended less on, uh, on copper, the difficulty there would have been much, much uh, less than uh, we see today. So as I, in, in conclusion, I talk about the fact that uh, uh, basically we need to do uh, what we should have done well 20 years ago. We need to think about institutions. The governor spoke about domestic resource mobilization. I agree entirely with it. We need to think about what development banks can do. There are many other institutions in Africa that have not functioned properly in the last 20 years. How do we get them to focus on development so that if there should be another shock, and there will be shocks in the coming years, uh, how do African countries respond and move on as if nothing had happened? Thank you very much. Well, those are both very impressive and to some extent uh, disturbing presentations, um, although there are some bits of optimism. Uh, and uh, uh, they did go on a little bit longer than we'd expected, so we'll have a little bit less time for Q&A uh, than we had hoped. Uh, but still, uh, I certainly want to have some interchange uh, between the distinguished members of this audience and the distinguished members of the panel. So let's uh, do that now for the African side of this panel. Uh, and the floor is open. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, do we have a roving mic? We do have a roving mic back there. Um, and uh, uh, let's start it with Steve Schiffer, whom I see right there. Uh, oh, the second one, that's it. Thanks, Steve Schiffer, uh, BBC News. I just wonder if uh, either of the panelists has any comments uh, looking at the human effects, the effects on poverty of the World Bank estimates of perhaps 50 uh, million more people um, in absolute poverty, and if you see going forward how this is going to affect the Millennium Development Goal targets, I mean, you made reference to that. Um, and just on a, on, a, on a separate point, one which is obviously a political in interest, um, do you have any views on whether the Chinese investment, uh, which has obviously been a big economic and political factor in, in Africa, will be uh, or has been affected by this crisis and whether that will uh, change things significantly? Thank you. Uh, I think we'll collect a few questions uh, and then to have our panelists respond to them jointly. Paul, I think you had your hand up. Yeah. Microphone down here, please. Thank you. This is to two comments. And a Paul Collier from Oxford. Right. Thanks, sorry. It's, it's two comments and a question. I mean, the first comment is just how distinctive um, the, the shock for Africa is, really, that um, in a nutshell, there seem to be three economic crises that play out. Uh, one in the sort of Anglo-Saxon economies where um, crazy mismanagement of the economy led to overextended households and firms. Uh, the crisis produced panic, increased savings rates, uh, and recession from, from increased savings rates. Then there's the, the sort of export economies, which is the, uh, the kind of Germany and East Asia, where the transmission mechanism runs through a collapse in manufactured exports, and hence hits the private sector. Um, and then in, in Africa, you've got the, the, the foremost route is through commodity prices, the collapse in commodity prices, um, uh, and some collapse in FDI, I think, but certainly the collapse in commodity prices. Now, that is basically a public sector, because the commodity <laughs> prices are the source of revenue for the government. And so, whereas the, the export economy is private sector shock, in Africa it's 
first and foremost a public sector shock, it's a revenue collapse. Um, hence the response, the first order of responses is going to be sort of government responding to falling revenue. And uh, I think there are kind of three layers of response. There's the, what you might call the reactive response, which is um, you regret some decisions that you took when you thought you were much richer than you're going to be. Um, are there any decisions you can unstitch? <coughs> So in particular, can you decommit from a load of recurrent expenditures that you now regret? So that's the sort of first reaction response. Then the second reaction is kind of cushion. Um, can you cushion the economy? And the extent to which you can do that um, depends uh, partly upon history. You know, Botswana can go to the African Development Bank and borrow because it's such a good record of managing its economy well. This is actually a repeat of what Botswana did in 1981. Uh, a collapse in diamond, an, an interruption in diamonds exports, it ran down its reserves and stabilized the economy. They know how to do this and they're doing it very well. Um, but of course a lot of economies uh, weren't in a position to, um, they hadn't built up big reserves, they hadn't got good reputations for, for borrowing, and um, on top of that, they were starting from <coughs> relatively low levels of investment to GDP. Now, if you'd started from high investment to GDP, you could stabilize by cutting investment. But as Richard Porter said, that would be a disaster if you start from suboptimal levels of investment, which is, which is the, the distinctive feature of Africa. I mean, that's just not true of Asia. Asia can afford to cut investment, Africa can't. Um, but maybe Africa does need stimulus for its economies, but it needs a stimulus which cannot be confused with um, a return to fiscal irresponsibility. And I suggest the package which can, can communicate a, a, a signal of fiscal responsibility whilst at the same time stabilize the economy is a package which reduces recurrent spending but increases capital spending more than you reduce recurrent spending. That package, which is politically tough, would stabilize aggregate demand and goes a little way towards rectifying the low level of, of investment. Um, now to my uh, question, uh, which is um, at some stage, <coughs> you've got to step back from this and draw the lessons of uh, what would you have done, uh, done differently? I mean, it, you, the, clearly, Africa learned a lot because the, the second, this, these commodity booms, as you say, were better handled than the commodity booms of the 70s. So there's been a lot of learning. What's going to be the equivalent learning that moves you so that next time this commodity booms, um, there's an equivalent leap in learning? Sheila Page, third one in there. Thank you. Uh, Sheila Page, Overseas Development Institute. Uh, two questions. First, uh, very specifically on Kenya. You said that there had been a huge buildup of stocks. Does this imply, must it imply, that, there's, that the unemployment increase hasn't happened yet and therefore will be happening when production goes down because the stocks have gone up? And if you want to speculate, would this have possible social and political impacts? And the other question is, you said, and Richard said as well, so this is perhaps for both of you, that it, sh the, uh, <coughs> it shouldn't be allowed to affect the, the development program, in a sense. Uh, but if your tariffs are down, and if, as Professor Ariti pointed out, countries learn from the 1970s that it's very risky to do the right thing if no one else is doing the right thing, do you actually think that you will have the resources to follow, not to cut development spending, and do you actually think it's risky to take that policy? Okay, I think uh, we've got three major contributions and questions there. Um, and uh, I will now turn to our two speakers to respond to them. Um, Ernest, why don't you start? Thank you very much. Uh, I think the uh, uh, question, first question was uh, whether the MDGs will be affected. Uh, it will vary from country to country. Uh, there are some countries where uh, expenditure on health and education uh, has been protected quite well, 
and uh, there are other countries that have considerable difficulty protecting such invest, uh, uh, expenditures. So my, my uh, informed answer is basically that um, countries like Tanzania will continue to move without much difficulty uh, on that front. Clearly, there are many, many African countries that will suffer on uh, one or two of these uh, MDGs. Uh, it's also important to understand that before the crisis came, there were many African countries that had difficulty with the movement towards the attainment of the MDGs. So if they are not able to attain the MDGs, it should not be because of the crisis. It will simply be the way the economies have performed and the way they are, are structured. Uh, the extent to which they can deal with poverty has a lot to do with how much they can do, what they can do with unemployment in these economies. And uh, don't forget that before the crisis, many of them had difficulty with unemployment, with underemployment, and many other structural features. Uh, there was also the question of whether Chinese investment will be affected. Clearly, that again depends on country, from country to country. Uh, we've seen evidence of sharp drops uh, in Niger, for example. Sharp, I mean, in Niger, there are reports of uh, several hundred Chinese firms leaving within months. You know, uh, there are other countries that have seen Chinese investment increasing. So again, it, it, it's very difficult to talk about what it will do to the entire uh, region. Uh, it will vary from country to country, depending on what kind of arrangements contracts have been agreed uh, with various Chinese uh, uh, bodies. I think Paul's perspective on uh, the crisis is spot on, as usual. Uh, the most important thing is the question, well, what, what has Africa learned from this particular one, and how will it do things differently in future? The, the, what I go around Africa preaching is that what this tells us is that we should have uh, gone much faster with the reforms we began 20 years ago. Uh, and if many of the institutions we sought to build, let's say in uh, tax mobilization, for example, we had built them properly, uh, the revenue collapse that we see in many countries would not have taken place. So the, the lesson from it is just continue with reforms and uh, do what you have to do. There are some reforms we began uh, in the 80s which have not been completed. There are institutions that we abandoned in the 80s that we need to revisit. The example I gave about the role of development banks, for example, I think it's something that we need to revisit. Uh, there's still a need for agricultural credit. How do you provide agricultural credit through the commercial banking stuff? It's not going to, it's like, it hasn't worked in 20 years, it's not going to work. So somebody has to take uh, some care of that. You know, so let's build the institutions which are built. Let's bring in policies that we slow down on for political reasons. Many of these things were slowed down largely because of the new politics. This new politics should learn to live with the new economics. That's my, my own view of things. And uh, I think that's the, what I have to say on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much because uh, Ernest has summarized some of these things. Let me say that one of the peculiar characteristics of Kenya in the East African community region is that it's very much dependent on exports in those regions and commercial. So it means that any effect in those countries devastatingly affects the country. In fact, that's one, that's one of the clear messages. In fact, the East African community is much more important than the European community, the European, the European region in terms of Kenya's export. And they are manufactured exports. So essentially, they directly affect even the SMEs. Now, this buildup of uh, even inventories, even manufacturing industry, is everybody is treating it as, let's say, it's a transition period. I remember the president's message in uh, the, 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 the October, uh, sorry, the June first. Long we hold on, maybe it will come to hit the banking sector because of the working working cost. But I do believe that as long as the regional countries are not going to suffer devastatingly, the Kenyan farms are going to perhaps uh, hold on until this crisis is uh, perhaps starts uh, uh, being overturned. MDGs, this is quite. Poverty is uh, increasing. In fact, one of the things we, we have seen is actually the, the, this, the, 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 what we have uh, perhaps achieved in the last perhaps 10 or so years in terms of poverty and education may be reversed. And it's, it's started, it will start showing. And so it means that the MDGs are also at risk. So it's something that we, we view that over time we are going to analyze and see what is really happening. It is true we are trying to bring up some perhaps development budget to try and support this. But obviously the next thing is where, how do you finance that? And that's the question that is coming up, is that you have to look for innovative ways. In February this year, 
in Kenya, we managed to raise um, an infrastructure bond, which has targeted projects in road network, irrigation project, geothermal, and it was heavily subscribed because it was like the government is saying, look, I would like to do this to try and support uh, development uh, spending, but I don't have the resources. Give me the resources and you invest in the resources. And that, for 10 years, it worked very well. We were very happy that this was working very well. But we also made sure that we described those projects that they can also <coughs> perhaps produce income that can actually support the repayment of those projects. So that we wanted to provide a gateway for other public sector institutions to do the same. So I think that is another avenue that we can utilize to try and finance this development spending. That's what I do believe. I think uh, uh, for the Chinese investment in Kenya, some of the, the sector, the IT is still a growing sector. And that is where, in, for example, in Kenya, the Chinese have come in. The other aspect is that they have been actually winning contracts in road networks and even fiber optic uh, ca uh, cables. These are going to continue. We don't see the effect coming down. Perhaps maybe we may look at other sectors that are suffering, they may suffer the same way. What could we have done better? Uh, I think Paul Coyer's question is a very difficult one because what could we have done better? Or how, what lessons have we learned? I think there are several lessons and one of them is actually even trying to work out the budget and the philosophy of the budget, what I saw in this last week in terms of the budget, the philosophy of the budget is telling us, let's do something different. One of them is actually recognize that if you have to deal with the political question of redistribution of resources, then you have to concentrate resources in where the rural areas and even where the potential of the economy to grow and even revive is there. So one of the first. The second one is perhaps even if you have to bring up projects, development projects, you have to make sure that you bring them in terms of where there is potential. Every day, this, every day I hear in, the, in, in, in Kenya that if you run a deficit, for example, six percent, we have about projecting 6.5 percent deficit, uh, fiscal deficit. Everybody is talking about it. The awareness is there. So it means that it is warning the, the, the policy formulation that, look, it is no longer saying blaming the World Bank and the IMF for the policies they brought in. And that's where it was easier to blame in the 1980s and the 1990s when inflation is rising. All there was an employment and everybody had someone to bring. Now, everybody is focusing on the policy formulation. Then it means that we have learned some lessons in terms of how to manage the economy. But we have also learned that there can be some slowdowns and uh, perhaps nose dives that we need to come up with knowledge base to try and revise that. Perhaps that's the best lesson for the policymakers. For the populace, I'm not so sure when it comes to voting whether they can follow that. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a disaster anyway. But um, I think there are important lessons that we are running. We are still trying to document them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. I know there are more questions out there. I apologize to those um, whom I saw and those whom I didn't see. Uh, but I think we are going to move on now to, uh, to Asia uh, and uh, uh, first to China. And we have Yu Yongding, the director of the Institute for World Economics and Politics at CAS. Can I use this? Yeah. Okay. You may. Yeah. In order to save time, I will not use uh, PPT and I just sit here. And the uh, uh, Chinese economy actually was hit very severely by global financial crisis, which is uh, quite surprising to people like me. Because uh, up until uh, last uh, October or December, we were still discussing uh, how to control inflation, how to contain overheating and so on. Certainly, over a few months, Chinese economy dropped a free fall. And uh, inflation turned to deflation. So why? And here, I want to give you an answer and so that uh, you can have a, a better understanding about the China's uh, current policy. And uh, you may have a better understanding of the consequences of this uh, current policy. I should emphasize that uh, China's uh, uh, economic growth has been extraordinarily good over the past uh, three decades. I don't think I need to repeat all those uh, figures. I just want to talk about China's economic growth from 2002 to 2007. In this stage, China's economic growth was characterized by very high growth rate of fixed assets investment. From 2002 to 2007, Average growth of uh, fixed assets investment is 24%, much higher than that of uh, GDP. 
As a result, the investment rate has been increasing very quickly. In 2001, the investment rate is just 25%. To 2004, this rate is surpassing 40% and rising. Actually, by the end of 2008, according to some statistic, this investment rate of the economy was as high as nearly 50%. And that's quite amazing. Uh, since 2002, because Chinese, the growth of the Chinese economy has surpassing the so-called potential growth rate. In China, there's some consensus about the Chinese potential growth rate. That is something like 9%. But uh, from 2002 to 2007, on average, the growth rate is something like uh, 11%. In 2007, it's 13%. So it's well about uh, China's potential growth rate. At the same time, we have seen inflation begin to increasing. We see lots of uh, assets bubble and so on. So since 2003, the Chinese government adopted uh, a tight monetary policy and a more or less neutral physical policy. I want to emphasize when Chinese, while the Chinese government is fighting against uh, uh, overheating, at the same time, overcapacity has been building up. Why? Because China's growth rate of fixed asset investment is very high. The investment, investment rate has been increasing. So you know that. So at the same time, we have overheating, but on the current, we have overcapacity. But for quite a long time, this overcapacity failed to surface or concealed by two major factors. The first one is a very strong investment demand. In order to absorb the old capacity of, say, 200 steel mills products, we built more steel mill to absorb the old capacity. Of course, this kind of practice is not sustainable. The second important factor is export. So by very strong export performance, a very large chunk of overcapacity was absorbed. Here I want to say a few words about China's uh, export. Because we rely on export to absorb overcapacity, we rely on export to increase employment. So to a certain extent, the so-called uh, BW2 uh, theory is uh, relevant to China. And uh, because this kind of uh, policy and the practice uh, Chinese economy become an economy which is highly dependent on external demand. Just give you a few uh, figures. In 2007, China's trade over GDP ratio is 6-7% of GDP, much higher than the United States, the Japan, which are so-called open economy. I think Japan's uh, uh, trade over GDP ratio is something like 20% of GDP, and China is 67. And China's export over GDP ratio is more than 40%. And in 2007, China's trade surplus over GDP ratio is something like 10%. And uh, hidden uh, overcapacity and over-dependent on external demand make the Chinese economy extremely vulnerable to external shocks. <coughs> and uh, when global financial crisis happened, especially after Lehman Brothers in last, uh, uh, last uh, September, external demand suddenly disappeared. So Chinese production dropped dramatically. Just give one example. In uh, last quarter, the most hit uh, Chinese industry is steel industry. And uh, among the reduction of products, more than 53% can be explained by the drop of direct demand for Chinese steel. Then in China, there are lots of other important uh, exporting sectors which use large amount of steel. So if we take this industry into consideration, then I can say more than 70, even more, even higher, more than 70% of uh, drop of China steel production in the last quarter, 
uh, last uh, in, in, in the first quarter of last year uh, uh, can be explained by the drop of uh, external demand. Combined effect of a certain drop of uh, external demand and uh, the slowing down of China investment growth, which is due to Chinese government's uh, con uh, contractual monetary policy, because uh, we were fighting against uh, uh, inflation. So the combined effect make the Chinese economy uh, stumble, tumbled, tumbled uh, from a very strong performance, very high growth to very low growth according to Chinese standard. Uh, last. Uh, uh, for in the last uh, quarter of last year, uh, China's uh, growth rate uh, fell to something like 6%, and uh, CPI fell to negative. So this is something quite uh, uh, horrifying for Chinese government and the public. And uh, because uh, Chinese uh, employment is highly dependent on exporting sectors, according to uh, uh, news reporters, we don't have very precise statistics, some 20 million uh, migrant workers who are working in coastal areas were made redundant. And we fear this will cause huge problems. But uh, I shall say the problem is not serious. It's OK now. But at the time, we really are very uh, fearful about the consequences. So the Chinese government take action and, and take action very quickly. We saw the dramatic fall in October. Just in November, there were so-called four trillion stimulus uh, package was introduced by the government. To see the scale of this uh, uh, stimulus package, I can just say that this uh, four trillion account for 14% of GDP in 2008, very large. And uh, the most important expenditure in this package is used in public work. Why? Because we want to pump up the economy in, in fastest way. It's very easy for you to employ, for example, uh, uh, 200 million workers <coughs> to build railway at the same time. If you want to do something else, it takes time. So we are in a hurry. So we take this, and this kind of policy, at least in short run, is very, very effective. And, uh, the second important expenditure in this uh, uh, package is uh, uh, to improve social safety net. And because we know this is a very important uh, uh, reason why uh, Chinese consumption is not very strong. So Chinese government uh, really try to improve economic structure while uh, try to uh, manage the crisis. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes the fear of the crisis uh, dominate the desire for structural reform. But anyway, up until last month, more than 62% more than of our public work expenditure has been used. So we actually implement this uh, uh, stimulus package in a very fast way. Uh, I want to say a few words uh, to, to make comments on this uh, stimulus package. I shall say that, uh, on the whole, this package is quite successful because in just uh, something like uh, four months, the fall of the economy was arrested. And the economy now is uh, broadening out. You can see uh, so-called green shoots everywhere. Mm -hmm. According to all measurements, the Chinese economy is uh, in the process of recovery. But on the other hand, the structure is not improved. And to a very large extent, very people, many people feel that uh, the structural issues are worsening. For example, as I already mentioned, the Chinese uh, growth rate of fixed asset investment was too high. But uh, in last year, and at this moment, the growth rate of fixed asset investment is even higher. And uh, for the first uh, five months of this year, the growth rate of fixed asset investment is 33%. And the investment rate is approaching 50% of the GDP. And at the same time, we are also have other problems. For example, in this uh, uh, package, very important item is uh, tax rebate for exporting sectors. More than 607 billion yuan was spent on this. Some people, lots of people ask, 
Why shouldn't we just uh, uh, give away this uh, uh, something like uh, six, uh, 670 billion yuan to workers who are made redundant? Maybe the result will be better. So these are controversial issues, but still, because uh, Chinese government still believe that export is extremely important, and perhaps uh, export can achieve a quick result. So we spend lots of money try to pump up those uh, exporting industries, try to uh, recover the growth rate of our export. But unfortunately, it's out of our control. Exerting demand is uh, under the control of the United States, European countries, and so on, not uh, under our control. Whatever you do, if there isn't a strong demand for your export, then you can't increase the growth rate of export. So that uh, uh, to the disappointment of uh, Chinese decision makers, uh, China's uh, growth rate for export was, uh, over the past several months, was very low. And uh, this is a problem. And uh, I think this kind of policy uh, is quite counterproductive because uh, you increase tax rebate. After you further distort price signal, you make a misallocation more serious. Then there's another issue, that is uh, sustainability of uh, China's uh, expansionary fiscal policy. On this uh, regard, I'm quite optimistic because uh, China's uh, trade surplus has been, uh, I'm sorry, the budget deficit has been quite low. In 2007, we ran a little bit uh, trade, uh, uh, budget surplus. Uh, the debt over GDP ratio so far is just 18%. After implementing this uh, stimulus package, and uh, by the end of this year, according to our prediction, uh, China's debt over GDP ratio still will be less than 20%, much, ben much better than Japan's 180%, better than European countries 60 or 70%, better than all major countries. And uh, China's uh, uh, budget deficit this year uh, has uh, 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 reaches the, a record high over the past 60 years. It is uh, 950 uh, uh, million, a billion yuan, equivalent to something like uh, uh, 140 billion US dollar, but still just 3% uh, of GDP. So it's not a big deal. And so we will have the, I mean, we, uh, in terms of our physical position, Chinese government is quite confident, uh, I mean, comfortable. But uh, at the same time, I want to emphasize this, the Chinese government should be, shouldn't be uh, complacent because a hidden problem is very serious. Because uh, in a hurry, we are pushing lots of projects. The return of those projects may be zero, may be negative, and very low. And uh, also, non-performing loan ratio may increase. And local guns' uh, uh, physical position may be very bad, but we don't know. So there are lots of uh, hidden debt contingent liability, so on and so forth. If we fail to revive the economy and uh, put the economy, put the growth on the right track, I mean, uh, to use uh, uh, private enterprises uh, as the, the major uh, 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 engine for the growth, and we can use up this uh, physical strength very quickly over a few years then uh, the, treat, uh, the, the, the debt over GDP ratio will be very high, then and there's no more room for government to continue to stimulate, stimulate the economy. And uh, finally, I will say a few words about the China's uh, uh, current, uh, uh, monetary policy. Uh, for, for the past uh, uh, five years until a uh, uh, financial crisis uh, hit, and uh, China's monetary policy is uh, relatively tight. And because uh, uh, People's Bank of China want to contain overheating, uh, want to use monetary policy to help to readjust economic uh, structure uh, to uh, actually to, uh, to, to, to make the Chinese economy less dependent on external demand, so on and so forth. But since the financial crisis worsened dramatically, I mean, since uh, last October, October uh, People's Bank of China shifted its policy from uh, tightening to a very expansionary position. Uh, in the first quarter of 2008, the growth rate of uh, credit is more than 
And uh, the goal of M2 is 25%. Uh, in China's uh, uh, mon uh, money market liquidity is abundant. Interbank interest rate in, in certain period of time is lower than interest rate on deposit. And so there's a saying among uh, Chinese bankers, the price of uh, uh, flour being more expensive than bread. This is the situation. And uh, personally, I think uh, uh, in, 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 since uh, uh, the last quarter of uh, 2008, China's uh, monetary policy is to, to, to lose. And, and lots of uh, enterprises, uh, lots of uh, commercial banks' uh, decision on extending loans are not based on commercial consideration. They are under lots of uh, non-commercial, non-economic uh, pressure. So they just uh, uh, extend loans and so on. And there's a very important characteristic of a Chinese economy, that is China's M2 over GDP, GDP ratio is extremely high. It's, uh, one, it's 180 percent of GDP, and this is the highest among all major countries, which means that the potential uh, inflation, if inflationary pressure uh, actually is very high. If uh, we just use a very uh, expansionary uh, monetary policy, definitely non-performing loan ratio will increase. And uh, lots of problems will, will happen. Now the gap between the growth rate of M2 and that of a nominal GDP is historically high. So potentially, inflation uh, pressure is quite high. And in summary, I shall say that uh, Chinese economy so far so good and uh, no big deal. But uh, from <laughs> longer run, uh, situation is more, uh, more uh, uh, um, it is not that clear anyway. And uh, I think the key is uh, whether the government can strike a fire balance between crisis management and uh, deepening the structural adjustment. In the, in the, financial, in the crisis management, Chinese government has been quite successful, really, quite successful. But uh, in the area of deepening of structural adjustment, it is not that successful. So in long, in short run, it's OK. I have no threat of doubt about the Chinese government's ability to achieve 8% growth rate for this year, maybe 8.2, 8.3. I have no doubt about that. But I don't know how about, the f I mean, five years later, what will happen? It depends on whether Chinese economy come successfully crack this kind of a previously existing, previously prevalent uh, irrational structure. Thank you. And now we turn to Sujit Bala uh, to get a perspective from India. Sujit. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my talk is in four parts. Uh, first, I'll discuss the crisis uh, before, present, and after. Secondly, um, I'll discuss, which is part of what the growth center, I guess, is occupied with, uh, the same question I've been occupied with for the last several years, is the determinants of economic growth. Um, the third part um, is some uh, perspective, some, if you will, uh, views on what happens now, uh, given if we have an idea of what the determinants of growth are, we can better be able to forecast. And last uh, but not least, perhaps, is uh, some actual forecast from my side of uh, both the Indian economy and the world economy uh, over the next uh, several years. So coming to the crisis, and I think it's very, very important that all of us, uh, whether examining Africa, China, India, um, identify the determinants of the slowdown. Uh, therefore, if you know the determinants of the slowdown, there's some idea that you can actually come up with policies to reverse the slowdown and get back to the normal growth path. And in that, you know, if you take that examination towards India, and the Indian economy, one conclusion is very striking. Uh, and that is that this entire crisis or entire slowdown in India was homemade. 
Uh, it wasn't manufactured abroad, and it wasn't, uh, if you will, uh, because of Lehman. Um, now, I think as far as the financial crisis is concerned, when history is written uh, a few years from now about this financial crisis, I think there will be, or there should be, a, a big distinction made between what happened pre-Lehman and what happened post-Lehman. Um, but overall, um, <clears throat> the, the evidence is quite strong, and I will now present some evidence on India as to why the pre-Lehman uh, crisis or the slowdown uh, was quite severe in India. Um, industrial production, which is the one most affected by policymakers, um, agriculture is not that affected, it's really affected more by rain than anything else. And services is a broad component that, if you will, goes along uh, with what's happening in the industrial sector. Industrial production growth in India, year on year, in August of 2008, was negative 1%. At its peak decline, industrial production growth in India <coughs> after Lehman was minus 4%. Really, uh, no big change whatsoever. And as you know, uh, that the industrial production declines in, in countries has galloped uh, downwards by about 10 to 15 percentage points. In India, there was no real big difference uh, between what happened pre-Lehman and what happened post-Lehman. So <clears throat> why, why did industrial production growth rate in India decline um, before the Lehman or before the global crisis really had its tentacles uh, around the world? Well, there you get into the assumed determinants of growth and what policy mistakes, in my view, uh, that led to. As far back as 2005, in April of 2005, the governor of the central bank announced that India was now in an overheating phase. Why did he do that? Well, from 1980 to 2002, 2003, India had basically grown at something like 55 to 6% per annum, GDP growth. Starting 2003 into 2004 into 2005, the, so the third year of uh, a GDP growth rate of above 8.5%, it seemed like a very fair conclusion that maybe uh, India is overheating. And so therefore, the tightening of Indian monetary policy started <coughs> as far back as 2005. Now, very curiously, um, this is a complete, was a complete replication of what happened in India in the mid-90s. As you know, the major reforms in India um, took place in 1991, and the GDP growth rate prior to the reforms was somewhere around five and a half, six. Uh, and basically, after the reforms, Indian GDP grew by 7.5% for the next three years. And the government of India, and particularly the Reserve Bank, panicked. <coughs> they said, this is overheating, and thereby then brought about a complete cranking down of the uh, growth rate, or if you will, a cranking up of uh, tightening of policy of interest rates, and for this next decade almost, Indian GDP growth was four to five, five and a half percent. Same story, 2005. We are growing at uh, too high a pace, therefore um, we have to really slow down. What the policymakers did not realize, or did not want to realize, which is perhaps a more accurate, because we in India were preoccupied, unlike Greenspan, et cetera, uh, with asset uh, bubbles. Uh, and the central bankers in India and some of the policymakers thought it was really, they had been chosen to really prick the asset wherever the bubble was occurring <coughs> and therefore to have in a perfect nirvana world that policymakers know everything, when to apply it, how much to apply it. And that was a thinking in India. And therefore we proceeded to uh, break the asset bubble. Did not quite realize the following, that between starting 2000, 
for 20 years prior to 2002, 2003, and this is very similar to what was happening in China as well, investment rate in India had hovered around 22 to 24% of GDP. Over the next six years, including today, the investment growth rate, the, the investment share of investment in GDP has improved very strikingly from something like 23, 24% to now 39.5% in 2008, in the year just passed. This is, and if you will, was this investment finance from outside? No. The current account deficit in India has stayed between 1% and 3% throughout. We're not a surplus country um, at all, and I think for one year, maybe we had a surplus of half percent of GDP. So savings rates, if you will, went up tremendously as well. So, there I want to conclude the first part of the, of the talk, which is that the growth rate in India and the decline in the growth rate was a homegrown affair. It will grow by about 6% this year and maybe inch upwards to 7% next year and succeeding year after. And what I don't understand is how is it that a country that grew at 6% with 25% investment rate will grow at 6% with a 40% investment rate. Now, to be sure, investment rates will decline uh, because of the crisis. But then, if one understands the determinants of growth, which I'll come to in a minute, uh, the speculation or the forecast clearly has to be that the investment rate cannot decline that far. And it's certainly all the high growth economies that we know of for the last 60 years, when they improve their investment rate, it stays around 35 to 45% for a long, long period of time. Um, and so there is no incident, there is no economy in history that shows, other than oil economies and small island economies, which I don't know much about, uh, but basically large economies do not have this big reversal because they are important uh, major forces at work that determine uh, what's happening. And those major forces, now I'll come to that. Uh, so therefore, uh, just to conclude on that forecast that is led by the IMF, um, is bordering on uh, irresponsible in, in my point of view. So what are the determinants? What are the really the long-term determinants of growth? And you know, everybody has uh, their list, but I think no matter where you look, uh, catch-up uh, would be number one in terms of that developing countries will tend to grow faster than developed countries. And this puts a perspective, a tangential perspective perhaps, on the decoupling versus coupling debate, that the development economics I read or understood or uh, learned had a sine qua non of development was that you would grow faster uh, than the developed world, and therefore there was always decoupling. Uh, but anyway, that's a, as an aside. Um, the determinants, catch up. The second is competitive interest rates, and this is where India has really faltered, except for a period from two, 1999 to 2003, which in my view led to the investment spike and the growth spike uh, that India did enjoy. Um, uh, so therefore, competitive interest rates, real interest rates at competitive levels is a very, very important feature of economic growth. Third is uh, competitive exchange rates, uh, and if you will, uh, a, a healthy um, undervaluation of currency really adds substantially to the growth rate. They are unhealthy, uh, can be uh, unhealthy undervaluations of currencies which lead to global imbalances but I will leave that perhaps for the discussion session. And last but not least is, at least from my vantage point, since I've worked on this for the last five years, uh, so I believe in that conclusion, is the growth of the middle class that really uh, acts as a real uh, determinant, uh, and if you will, as an accelerator of economic growth. Um, so those are the factors, and as you can see, that this has very little to do with the crisis and what countries should or should not do. These are long-run processes that one has to appreciate and understand. And actually, while on long-run 
processes, just to put into perspective as to how we should not get carried away by black swan events. And last year, there were several, not just one. I mean, the whole 2008 was a black swan. Uh, but one perspective on long-run factors is the following. That China and India had approximately 45% of the world's population way back in 1500, and had 45% of world income. So their average income was equal to that of the world. In 1980, that's 480 years later, uh, China and India had only 8% uh, of world income and uh, had 40% of the world's population. So basically, one-fifth average income in China and India was one-fifth of the world average. Over the last, uh, now, what, 28 years, and by my forecast, by 2020, and this forecast is independent of whether the world is in a continuous crisis or continuous black swan event, et cetera, because it's about relative growth rates, that average income in India and China will be equal to the world average by 2022. So what the world or what China and India lost in 450 years, it will gain back in 45 years. That's the revolution of all time. That's the mother of all growth revolutions, and that is what the world economy and India and China is going through, notwithstanding the banking crisis of 2008. But that gives you a perspective on what uh, long-run processes can do and what, if you will, an appropriate set of policies in a globalized era can really enhance uh, your, product, your, your prospects for the future. Okay, now uh, coming to uh, what happens now. Um, we've had the crisis, we've had, uh, if you will, from my vantage point, not so good monetary policies. Uh, what do we do now, or what happens now? And I think it's, very, it's safe to say, from my perspective, that India will grow at something like 7 to 8 percent without any aid from the government. Now, clearly, the, you know, mind you, this is all Keres Paribus. The world collapses for whatever reason. Though you know a second black swan, a third, uh, or second black swan e uh, event between one or two years is highly, highly unlikely. So let's table that outside. Nuclear explosions, let's table that outside. Basically, India should grow at seven to eight percent this year, without any help from the government. So last five years, the Indian government, while the investment rate was going up from 23% to 39%, and I challenge anybody in the entire world, including this audience, to point out one policy that this government, that the Indian government brought on in the last five years to help India's growth rate. There's none. There's several negative policies it brought on, but no positive policy. So therefore, without any aid from the government, Indian, uh, without any aid from reforms from the part of the government, the Indian economy should grow at 7 to 8%. If the government does bring about reforms, and I think there are some chances of that happening, then I think an 8 to 9%, 9.5% growth rate for India is very, very possible. Second major conclusion, if you will, uh, is that the Indian growth rate uh, over the next 5 to 10 years will be higher than China's growth rate. That's not that China's growth rate will collapse, but China, remember, after having the same per capita income as India for 500 years, over the last 30 years, its per capita income now is three times higher than that of India. So therefore, there is a catch up within, between India and China, and, and China is a much more mature economy, and therefore its growth rate will tend to fall below 8%, whereas India's growth rate will tend to rise above 8%. Um, Last but not least, and I think I'll be pretty much on time if I finish in the next couple of minutes, um, that what about the global economy? And you've had <clears throat> several uh, views expressed daily in the media, uh, and this will continue to happen. Uh, we have the alphabet soup all over the place, but broadly there is one view which holds that, uh, and which is a very pronounced view, uh, that's the IMF view, led by the, the guardians at the IMF, uh, the World Bank, the OECD was with them until very recently, which is to say that we are in for doomsday times for at least the next couple of years. Um, then there are the others, 
uh, who believe that, look, okay, you're seeing a few green shoots, maybe a few in China, maybe a few in India, but really uh, you'll get a little spike up and then we'll go back down again and perhaps stay there. That's the L-shaped view. And then there is the W view, which is really the fence sitter's view, because it says, yes, there'll be a V-shape, but yeah, you know, maybe um, there will be a reverse V-shaped uh, later on. Uh, now, you know, I was taught by my professor uh, 25, what, 30 years ago, Ray Fair, one of the original forecasters of the US economy, that the job of, or the job of a forecaster was to forecast often and always remind people when you're right. Now, in that context, in that context, that is how we need to view what has happened in terms of the downward forecast that the world has received. Um, and if you will, if you take a portfolio approach, that even the most successful people who forecast the downturn, and I was not clearly amongst those people who forecast such a severe downturn, particularly post Lehman. Pre Lehman, I think, all of us were broadly in the same camp, uh, that they had the world collapsing, which it did uh, post Lehman, but they also had the dollar collapsing, which it didn't, and they had US interest rates rising to 7 8%, which it clearly didn't. So just to put a perspective, a portfolio approach of those people who got the downturn right, you'd have lost money following their approach. Obviously, you lost money if you didn't follow the approach, but I don't think this was one case where the whole class failed. And that is what happens with black swan events. Um, finally, so therefore now, uh, I've given you my Indian forecast. I've given you a forecast for China. Uh, I think the developed world is very likely to see a, a V-shaped recovery. Um, there will be some structural changes. I think the banking sector will not be as pronounced and will not contribute that much to growth for several years to come. And the US growth rate, rather than being 3 3.5%, three for the previous decade will be two and a half to three percent. As my friend from China said, no big shakes. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, the developing world, led by China and followed by India, will provide a major buffer for the developed world and in that sense, bring coupling back into fashion again. Thank you very much. Well, it's good to have our final formal presentation end on such a positive note. Um, I would say, however, just a little bit of caution may be warranted. Uh, Surjit said that uh, a second black swan was, I quote him, highly unlikely. Well, I shall have to get him to walk through Regent's Park with me. Um, I live on one side of the park, and I work on the other side of the park, and very often going through, I see our local black swans. We actually have two in Regent's Park Park. I just warn you, right? Uh, well, we'll take a little bit of time for Q&A, uh, and I don't want to keep, we don't want to keep you from the refreshments provided outside, uh, but I'm sure that some uh, interventions are, uh, are forthcoming. Please, tell us who you are. Okay, I'm, I'm Jibril Alenyi from the OFT. Uh, Thank you for these interesting presentations. Uh, one, one thing that has happened in China in particular over the past years is the growth of the private sector. The government has delegated a lot of provision of uh, goods and services to uh, private businesses. And since this crisis started, some countries have responded by restricting some provision by the private sector or creating this intention to expand the public provision. And the focus from India seems to depend on the assumption that there will be no structural changes. Do you, do you really think, the answer could come from India or China or even Africa, do you really think that there would be no uh, competition between private and public sector with this uh, increasing credit constraint to these economies? Thank you. <coughs> Question here, please. Atharu San, London School of Economics. So just to complement or present what Professor used, very stimulating talk is from an internal point of view. The counterpart to China's heavy independence on export, we should look at the distribution side. 
China's profit rate, the share of wages in national income, has been low and has been falling for a number of years. Consumption ratio in China is less than 40%, which is exceptionally low. So what I'd suggest is that some of the policy prescriptions are probably highlighted if we don't look at so much external side, but the internal side of share of wages being very low, share of consumption being exceptionally low. So it's a paradox that the worker state is actually has been quite good at controlling wage rates in China. The third point of view of employment is the manufacturing sector in China is one of the largest in the world for the third largest economy. I think part of the problem is, turn it around, manufacturing is not creating all that many jobs in China, is the service sector is very small. And one route, again, point to the internal factors is probably the hindrance to, to rural urban migration, which is built in the household registration system, which is ultimately maybe account for a relatively low size of the service sector. Right here, right in the uh, third row there, please. Thank you. Uh, Claire Malamed from Action Aid. Um, one of the things that we're seeing in the communities where, where we work in both Africa and Asia is how the food crisis and the financial crisis are really intersecting in the lives of people and creating, in a sense, a shock which has now been going on for a year. I don't know if that is still a shock, but um, that's what it's still feeling like to people. Um, and I wonder whether the experience of this year um, has shown us, in terms of the way that we analyze growth and the way that we um, the sort of indicators that we use to measure the success of growth, whether part of making growth benefit poor people is also to pay attention to the resilience of that growth and how the growth and the, the way that poor people are benefiting from growth is likely to withstand external shocks of the kind that we've been seeing um, over the past year. And whether as part of our sort of considered analysis of growth and policy prescriptions for improving growth, we should actually think consciously about how to make growth more resilient to shocks. And if we were to do that, what would be the difference in terms of the types of policies and the types of indicators that we might use to measure the success of growth? Thank you very much. I know there are more questions out there, but again, I feel a bit constrained by time, and I think I should pass to our uh, two panelists uh, who've just spoken and get their responses to these questions. Professor, okay. Professor Yu? Okay. And as I mentioned, the most important challenge uh, faced by the Chinese government is how to strike a balance between crisis management and uh, economic restructuring or rebalancing. This is really very difficult. And uh, I entirely agree that uh, one of a uh, very important contributing factor to the imbalance of the Chinese economy is the low consumption. Uh, Chinese uh, uh, household consumption actually is quite, quite low. And uh, I, I mean, uh, even Chinese economy as whole has a high saving rate, but uh, until uh, very recently, this high saving come mainly from enterprises sector, then uh, gun sector, and lastly from household uh, sector. So one of the very important uh, uh, tasks faced by Chinese government is why you are using especially uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy to stimulate the economy. You have to pay attention to structural reform. And one of the very important uh, uh, tasks for the government is to reduce the gap between rich and poor. In China, this gap is very high compared with many different countries. So Chinese government should implement policies to allow poor people to increase their wages, to get more social uh, benefits, so on and so forth. This is a, a very important task. As I mentioned, this uh, has been included in China's uh, uh, stimulus package. This is the second most important item in the four trillion uh, package. The thing is that in a hurry, in a rush, we, I mean the government, uh, maybe could not pay enough attention to this at a certain stage. But I think now more and more public uh, 
uh, actually more and more people are realizing you must do this. Otherwise, your growth cannot be sustainable. So number one, uh, Chinese government now is trying to uh, encourage uh, private emp enterprises to take more initiative, especially in terms of credit. Uh, private sector has been discriminated against by Chinese banks for credits and so on. And now situation has been improved a little bit, but not enough. And also, uh, the gap between rich and poor now is decreasing a little bit, but not good enough. What I'm trying to say is that all these issues have been realized by the Chinese government and the public, but uh, it's easily set them down. So we must be uh, patient. At the same time, we should put pressure on these makers to pay attention to these issues. Thank you. Sujit. Um, just briefly, the, I sort of three points raised. A couple of them were specific to China. Um, but I will take this liberty of also commenting um, on China. The, the first one was on uh, whether there is something to the effect of whether there's structural change or not in terms of the credit constraint uh, imposed by the crisis. Um, you know, we, most of the analysis of the crisis is on, or the most of the interpretation of the crisis as to why it got bad or it got so bad was that there was too much leverage and we had then uh, the high inflation. So the concern of the world economy uh, exposed and perhaps even ex ante was that there was too much leverage and basically that this would be ultimately inflationary and that ties in into the question on the food crisis and the, and the food inflation that we had. Um, today, you know, policymakers, investment bankers, everybody around the world uh, is praying for some increase in leverage and for some inflation. <laughs> so I think if you look at it from a broad, um, longer term perspective, um, not much has really changed and not much uh, will change, though I do think leverage will be brought down and that's a positive factor. Global imbalances and the consumption rate, and I think there I can't emphasize more uh, how important uh, and unusual uh, China's uh, consumption rate, very low consumption rate is. And that, if you will, uh, has been a major problem for the world economy. The euphemism for that is global imbalances. But I think that's where the solution is. It's a win-win situation where the Chinese consumption rate over time graduates towards something like 45 and perhaps even 50 percent. And that will add a lot of uh, benefits for the poor, uh, for China, and if you will, for the world. So they will, their increase in consumption rate will substitute uh, for the lack of uh, consumption demand elsewhere in a broad uh, sort of overall world accounting sense. And I think uh, it is quite likely uh, that that will happen. On the, the need for China's exchange rate to appreciate, um, you know, China had already moved from something like 8.3 to 6. 6.85, uh, and then they stopped because of the crisis in October or so. But you know what? It's tied to the dollar, and the Chinese currency is appreciated, which I think is another very positive thing for global imbalances and future growth, by about 15 to 20 percent because it's tied to the dollar, and the dollar is appreciated. So don't look for nominal appreciation of the Chinese currency. Uh, look for real appreciation. And you know, the one lesson that I draw from the crisis is that we are all in bed together. And I think policy making is not now uh, either just in England or just in India or just in Africa or just in the US or just in China. I think there's a very significant amount of coordination going and that is, if you will, a major reason for me being somewhat optimistic. Last but not least, on resilience of growth, uh, which I think is quite an important um, aspect for discussion. And, you know, both the uh, presentations uh, from the African side emphasize that, look, with our fiscal deficit so high, uh, there is no room for uh, really protecting the poor uh, when it comes to the crisis. And I really think, uh, and this, I, this is a criticism leveled uh, starting from the IMF, 
uh, and uh, the World Bank, where Govind and I were, were colleagues for many years, um, and down the line, that why do we talk about the fiscal deficit and never, never about the expenditure policies of the government, which have enormous amounts of corruption, enormous amounts of leakage, which is really the real problem. Now, in 1985, India's Prime Minister, uh, Rajiv Gandhi, said that out of every 100 rupees meant for, for the poor, only 15% reached the poor. My later analysis and several others suggest that Rajiv Gandhi was a wild-eyed optimist. This is where we need to concentrate. All you guys from the DFID, the sponsoring organization, the aid organizations, we keep harping about the fiscal deficit and do not harp about expenditure efficiency, expenditure targeting, really improving. You will have a lot of scope, whether in Africa or in India or anywhere else in the world, for improving and protecting the poor. You know, we think, oh, we've got to do this in the name of the poor. The name of the poor is a new secular uh, language that we all speak. And all our policies, 99% of them, do not really help the poor. So please remove the focus, my plea is, from fiscal deficits and get down to the real problems which are irresponsible governments spending a lot of money on themselves in the name of the poor. Okay. I'll stop there. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think I can add one. one. You, <coughs> and uh, I think I should uh, add one uh, information. Uh, over the past uh, five months, uh, the uh, strongest growth uh, in, in China is uh, from uh, consumption. And uh, I mentioned that uh, China's uh, 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 investment rate has been very high recently. That is at the expense of uh, export, not at the expense of uh, uh, consumption. So this is uh, very good news. Mm -hmm. okay. Over to you, Gobind Nankani, to conclude. Well, thank you very much, Richard. I think first let me start by thanking our four speakers for really excellent presentations, very, very informative and provocative. I don't think it's, um, it's, diff it's easy to, to give you a, a quick summary of, it, of what they've said. But I do feel that there are two or three points we can take away. Uh, first of all, I think it's very clear that in all of our developing country uh, represented here, the impact of the crisis has, of course, been to affect growth. But, but in, in all cases, growth has fallen but stayed in the positive realm, which is uh, something you can't say for many of the developed countries. But the biggest challenge, it seems to me, has been the impact of the crisis on potential future growth. And here, I think the common theme running through all of the presentations was the critical importance, whether it was Ghana or Kenya or other African countries or China or India, the critical importance of responding to this global crisis by deepening reforms in our own developing countries and the importance of recognizing that the short-term responses, which have varied considerably depending on country context, um, don't actually uh, exhaust what needs to be done. There is a lot more that needs to be done in the way of deepening reforms. I think this is emphasized particularly on the China side, but so also by, by the other speakers. And I also want to close by coming back to the point that was raised here about the resilience of growth. I think, I think what the global crisis does tell us is that volatility is very much a part of the global economy. And um, in whatever ways resilience can be built into, into growth strategies, the premium on that has gone up considerably now. And, and, and uh, I think it's a new research agenda, really, to try, try and think through what this might mean in different kinds of, of economies. But the issue of resilience, and the one country that has been extremely impressive in terms of having a growth path that has been resilient over two to three decades, at least two, has been Chile, which has built tremendously strong fiscal and other institutions to help buffer itself against external shocks, one after the other. I mean, whether it, whether it was the tequila crisis or the Brazilian crisis or whichever crisis, somehow Chile seemed to have managed to do it better than anyone else, certainly uh, in the developing world. So.
I hope that gives us some food for thought as we go forward. We have refreshments out in front, and I hope you can also buttonhole some of the speakers if you didn't get a chance to, to ask them your questions. Thank you all very much for being here with us this evening.